Hello, and welcome to the COVID Advocacy Exchange. I'm Dave Fuhr with Grit Health, and we are honored to welcome you to this session today on getting back to work. There are so many ways that we all have been affected by COVID, but when I think about this topic and what we as patients and survivors and caregivers deal with in our life to be in the workplace and to live in work environments, oftentimes that makes us feel like we have to hide things. I remember going through my second cancer diagnosis, feeling like I couldn't be as open as I wanted to about the ways I was affected as a patient. And if we have one hope for this session and for our time together, it's that we have a chance to be open. You'll hear from some of the most authentic and inspiring individuals who are working tirelessly every day to create better workplaces for us who need them. And most importantly, in our breakouts, you'll have a chance to use your voice. My ask, and to the extent that you're comfortable, is to please join us in that conversation. The thing that I and we as a team care deeply about is helping people find their voice and use their voice. This COVID advocacy exchange is all about advocacy. And when we think about that with a capital A, it means finding our voice to stand up for what we need and to help others finding what they need. In a second, I'm going to introduce somebody that I've been very honored to meet through this program. And before I do, I just wanted to share something with you, specific to something I saw in a documentary recently. It feels really relevant to this. And so at the end of this documentary, they ended by saying, anything that can't be spoken becomes an internal danger to ourself. When your reality is not allowed to be seen or to be known, it is a new trauma. Just forgive yourself for all the ways you've tried to survive. The only thing that is really real are the things we're not yet talking about. And with that, to me, profound perspective on the importance of this topic, I am deeply honored to welcome Tina Marie Duff, who is the global lead for Bristol Myers Squibb's Differently Abled Workplace Network, a part of their People and Business Resource Group. Thank you, and please welcome Tina Marie. Thank you, Dave. And thank you for this platform. It's incredibly, incredibly important, the work you're doing. And October is such a significant month. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. It's Disability Employment Awareness Month. So lots, of, lots going on. And I'm really honored to be able to speak with you and all the folks on the line today. So let's get started. Right? As we all know, the world changed 28 weeks ago. And we all have this new sense of normal. There are a few pre-COVID mandates and, and myths that have kind of been turned upside down and in many cases for the better. Things like our corporate culture is to participate in in-person training or we prefer our employees to work from an in-office setting. We all know that some of this stuff is just not safe to do right now. In 2013, Yahoo CEO mandated that all employees work from a Yahoo physical location, stating that they could only be productive as a team if they were all in the same office setting. Well, in May 2020, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey, in a forward-thinking, unprecedented statement, told his employees that they may work from home forever. And how about this kind of new term that we're confusing, um, the return to work? In the past, this phrase of returning to work was reserved for our colleagues, our colleagues who may have been on a disability or out on maternity leave. Now this process of returning to work is actually referring to a safe return to work for employees who were home working from a virtual setting and now return to an actual you know, office building. So today I wanna to share a few thoughts with you. I wanna share thoughts about the COVID impact and how it's felt by the disability community. I wanna highlight that we have more in common with the disability community than we probably ever thought or realized. 
and then also share how we can continue to innovate, engage, and deliver things as we emerge from COVID and safely return to the physical office space, which is now opening doors of opportunity for people with disabilities to contribute and add value to work, the workplace. Since the earliest COVID-19 information became available, the disproportionate impact on the pandemic to the disability community has been ascribed as old, fragile, or with underlying conditions. And in fact, these are all euphemisms for disability. And we know the profound impact that COVID has had on each and every human around the world. We also know that the disability, the disability community is often disproportionately impacted as from things like pandemics or um, events like hurricanes, natural disasters, right? So as we get started, let's look at the impact COVID has had on the disability community. It's not uncommon for the disability community to lack access to accurate and timely information, especially for those who are living with blindness, low vision, or those who are part of the deaf and hard of hearing community. And for some people with disabilities, COVID has just exasperated the disease or increased the side effects of their conditions. Things like depression, anxiety, OCD, um, even reports of individuals who have been in recovery for years from sub substance abuse are now just struggling with the loss of routine or access to their support groups. Next, we're seeing this impact on home health care services and personal assistance services. Depending where you are in some states and areas, if you have an essential worker in your home, it means that your home care nurse or your social worker or other, dis or other team members just can't come and support you. And sometimes that extended family member who's often part of the extended caregiver, caregiving team are, is unable to come and help. You know, in all efforts to keep our uh, circle small and limit exposure for everybody's safety. Many COVID test sites are not accessible to individuals with disabilities, or even if they are accessible, they just encounter such barriers, things like lack of accessible and reasonable modifications, or just general lack of access because of car or transportation to some of these sites and the drive-through sites. And most recently with the coronavirus pandemic, people in hospitals across the country have been denied visitors, family members, and personal assistants and um, disability service providers. This creates barriers for people with disabilities to access their typical support systems, which is just key to effective communication and care. And we know that from the Partnership of Inclusive Disaster Strategies, COVID-19 and Disability Rights Report, that there's an outsized number of COVID-19 deaths that occur in congregate settings, such as nursing homes and other facilities and long-term care facilities, and even as COVID-19 outbreaks in congregate session facilities soar, it's more likely to discharge a person with a disability into a nursing facility than into their own home and community setting with services and support systems. I like to remind people that you don't go into a nursing home because you're old. You go into a nursing home because you have a disability that just you or your family or society just can't take care of within a dignified way. Marcy Roth, who is the CEO of WID, the World Institute on Disability, she shared with me recently that there was a congressional report published this past September, and it found that the number of deaths in congregate facilities has not slowed in December. All were almost people with disabilities, communities of colors, and many experienced poverty. We've learned a lot since the start of COVID, particularly related to colleagues who live with disabilities that are non-apparent. As we lead through this change, it's important that we message and engage our workforce with disabilities, whether they have self-disclosed or not. Over the past several years, I've had the opportunity to head Dawn, which is our differently abled workplace network. It's a disability focused resource, uh, people resource group at Bristol Myers Squibb. We have several of these organizations in our company. My group, Dawn, it spans across almost 20 countries and into five continents. Our team is out front with change. Why? Because we lived it prior to COVID. Our people and business resource group in a rapid and thorough response to support our BMS colleagues with the workplace matters that affect them as a result of the quick shift in workplace location, delivery and demands and privacy implications. We know and we're ready to support the safe return to work. 
I think it's important that companies understand that for some of our colleagues, they like routine, the structure, the social support of being at work. We also know that others who are living with a disability may have an interest in working from home as an accommodation. In this case, companies may start to see an increase in the number of workers with disabilities who are self-disclosing their disability to be able to um, secure that work from home accommodation. And let me also remind you that mental health disabilities were on the rise prior to COVID pandemic. It was actually predicted to be the number one workplace disability in 2020. This lens is just not unique to people with disabilities. Um, we intersect all communities. And we're seeing an increase in mental health crisis across diverse groups. I'll share with you data from the McKinsey and Company report specific to Asian American community. Crisis Text Line, which is a nonprofit group that provides free mental health support via text messaging, they saw a 39% increase in texts from Asian, America, Asian Americans in the first quarter of 2020. And these mental health challenges are complicated with additional barriers. Many don't offer language services for Asian patients and mental health treatment is often stigmatized in the Asian American community, as often in many other communities too. But as a result, only 5.8% of Asian Americans actually sought out any type of mental health services or resources. And that's compared to 19% of white Americans. COVID precautions and this like new normal, you know, it's not new to many people living with a disability. What is new for all is actually pretty normal for some, and I'll give you a few examples. New, the entire world is wearing a face mask. Well, we know that patients receiving cancer treatment or those who may have other autoimmune compromising conditions, they've needed to wear a face mask for their own personal safety prior to COVID. So not so new. And then just layer on the additional burden of trying to figure out how to get to like an infusion clinic safely, right? So also no, we're all isolated and intersect with only a small group. Well, people with disabilities are often isolated and only interact with their family or caregivers. So that's kind of not so new. What else is new is the thought and the questions we're all asking ourselves. How do I get my groceries? How am I going to get to work today? How am I going to find employment, attend university, go to a doctor's appointment safely? The concept of needing to be innovative and creative regarding day-to-day -day logistics is just not new to the disability community. But there is good news emerging on the front of um, innovation and empathy. We all know we cannot participate in a virtual meeting or an event without some participants saying, you're on mute. Unarguably, the expression of 2020. And so now we know, all know the frustration of others who are receiving the information or giving the information, right? But what's not so new and eye-opening is that for years, people who are members of the deaf and hard of hearing community would often show up in person to conferences or events or attend a web event without access to a sign language interpretation or real-time captioning. Our deaf friends have been saying, you're on mute for a long time. And I just wanna pause and acknowledge the GRIT team for having two interpreters for this event. So thank you for that, right? But I've also personally seen a huge increase in captioning and just standard accessibility features being introduced into all the ways we conduct business. It's just very like inspiring and, and gives me a lot of hope. You know, we all are working also under these unfamiliar conditions with just unexpected distractions. And a colleague shared with me that she finally understands what it's like to be her daughter, her daughter with um, attention deficit disorder. See, she's saying, my colleague said that it takes her now twice as long to do a standard month end report than it ever did prior to, uh, to COVID because of all the interruptions that she's feeling and exper experiencing and the distractions. I think it's something we all can relate to. And let us not all forget how we're looking to telemedicine visits, touchless door, doors, foot poles, automatic soap dispensers and towel dispensers, the clear wayfinding markings, and even just need assistance retrieving products from like high shelves because of the limited inventory. Our brothers and sisters in the disability community have been advocating for and looking for all of these things which are now just essentials for all of us, but in the past have only been conveniences for a few. So prioritizing health and safety of your workforce is paramount. And it's important for us at Bristol Myers Squibb. 
But returning to work affects many, not just one. So companies need to recognize that the workforce, specifically those with disabilities and those that are caregivers to someone with a disability are just experiencing COVID pandemic differently. Some are eager to return to work, some are reluctant, you know, and some are just having situational disabilities that are arising because of COVID, things like anxiety, ADD, depression, right? So while Noreen Gleason will be talking more about this topic after me, we've already concluded that extensively communicating your organization's availability to support programs in the workforce is essential. Leveraging internal resources like employee assistance programs, mental health ally programs, advocate relationships, they all will help you know, address the concerns that many are experiencing right now due to the season of isolation. At BMS, Dawn partnered with our own um, patient advocacy team, and we just launched an employee cancer support network. The group provides education and support for our employees impacted by a cancer diagnosis, whether it's a patient, caregiver, or even a colleague. You know, we've designed webinars that are specifically um, designed with the, the pa cancer patient in mind and are helping those uh, employees navigate through the current pandemic crisis. And it's important that we continue to keep an open communication line and leverage things like employee resource groups, advocacy organizations, and experts to help provide key insights and data that can be used to derive decisions and tactics that can help improve the care to all, including those that are impacted the greatest by COVID, which is often communities of color and communities with poor economic um, and employment barriers, which is such a common intersectionality with the disability community. Excuse me. So recently, Dr. Sherelle Barber, she's an epidemiologist. She was a guest on Disability Matters, which is a podcast and a radio show um, that I listen to regularly. So while working on the links between structural uh, racism and health inequities, both in the US and in Brazil, she eloquently stated, this is her quote, I try to bring equity and a justice lens to the work I do using data to make the invisible visible, mobilizing data to have a real impact on the communities. When I think about that, I just think how we can, how, there's so much to learn, right? So companies and organizations may want to lever, leverage their internal teams to provide those insights and create the opportunities to support the communities that we have that are being impacted by COVID. The caregiver definition can extend beyond that traditional definition of a medical team and family, but really into the workplace. At BMS, our PBRGs are, have supported the community in many ways, like too many to even start to list here, but things like offering lunches to frontline workers or working with blackdoctors.org to create a COVID uh, education campaign that I think is launching real soon. And at last, as, as business leaders, let us not miss this incredible opportunity that we have to learn from the disability community. The disability community is ripe with talent and it has a desire to work, but yet current data, no matter where you look, shows that the participation of people with disabilities in the workplace is less than half than in the civilian workforce. So if organizations continue to include disability smart practices and inclusive best practices to drive a culture of inclusion for the disability community, they will attract new talent to the workplace. And also, by continuing to deploy things like virtual hiring events, virtual interviews, accessible e-learnings, digital technology, right, while also addressing stigma of disabilities, not only will there be this increase in the talent pool, but you'll have an open attitude and an environment that's been built with accommodations and accessibility that will sustain that talent. <clears throat> Over the last seven months, businesses around the world have been called to address, you know, called to action to address a huge issue, a gigantic issue, one that nobody was prepared for, one that has accelerated spread and forced change among the workplace, the workforce, and the marketplace. And I think it's safe to assume that most companies had no budget set aside and had not planned for it. And it wasn't a 2020 strategic imperative, um, uh, imperative on the strategic plan. I mean, at least it wasn't for me. But our call to action as we celebrate October and Disability Employment Awareness Month is let's continue to apply the same creativity so that we may include and engage all talent, including those with disabilities. As Henry Ford said, 
whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So we can, and we have, and we will. Thank you for this time. And now, I would really like to introduce a colleague of mine, Noreen Gleason, who, and Noreen leads our business continuity and crisis team at Bristol Myers Squibb. Noreen? Thanks, Tina Marie. Um, I am proud to call you my colleague. Your passion is infectious, and I couldn't be more honored um, to do this presentation with you. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much to, to GRIT for, for having both um, Tina Marie and I here. This is a, a great opportunity to speak to you today about Bristol Myers Squibb's response to this unprecedented pandemic and how we are getting people back to work. Like I said, it's an honor to be here. When I was first asked to participate in this event, I immediately Googled GRIT, sorry, and started to review your mission, goals, and objectives. I also asked a few BMS colleagues about GRIT and found that you are highly, very highly regarded org organization. I'm very moved by your commitment to our mutual cancer patients. Here at BMS, we are so aligned with you. GRIT has all now has become personal to me. I lost my mom several years ago to cancer, and there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about her and wish I could share the many advances that pharma companies and advocacy groups like yours has made. What a difference you would have made to my mom, especially as a mediator between the doctors and our family. And more recently, my dad is a new cancer survivor as well, and I've already shared your website with him. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything that you do. Now, unfortunately, to discuss another insidious and challenging disease that has gripped the world, let's talk about COVID-19 and how we get people back to work. First and foremost, let me start with saying that this virus has affected all of us in very different ways. Some of us have never stopped working at our work sites. Here at BMS, we've had folks coming in every day to make sure we can keep providing our medicines to our patients. Some of us who are working remote welcome the opportunity to return, to see our colleagues and our friends. Others might actually enjoy working from home. I would be one and might be interested in doing it more often than we have in the past. Some of you will have suffered COVID-19 yourselves or cared for loved ones who have. Even worse, some of you may have lost loved ones and friends and are experiencing intense grief. For this, I extend my sincere sympathies to all of you, and I recognize the enormity it has been for people who are differently abled and or were already suffering from life-threatening illnesses prior to the spread of COVID-19. When COVID cases were first reported in the US in February, Bristol Myers Squibb acted very quickly to assess the situation for our patients and our employees. Last year, we stood up a team called the Corporate Event Response Team, also known as the CERT. In essence, this is a corporate crisis management team that leads the company during serious events. It's comprised of approximately 14 subject matter experts across all areas of the company who provide factual, timely information and recommendations to our CEO, Dr. Giovanni Cafario, and his leadership team for quick decision making. Here's how we've operated since February, and this is really how we were able to get people back to work safely. The team meets regularly at times daily and engages in cross-functional enterprise-wide manner with business partners to understand their needs and the impacts of the crisis. We conduct industry and non-industry benchmarking to ensure we understand best practices and identify areas of improvement. We leverage existing crisis plans, rapidly identifying issues leading to swift resolution and identify forward scenario planning, really with a very strategic view on how this is going to play out in, in the long run. We provided factual, reliable information latest developments and recommendations to Giovanni and the leadership team so they can effectively and timely provide support, guidance, and leadership. What really has helped in this area has been complete 24-7 access to the CEO and leadership team members as needed. Um, when we talk about this with other companies, this is something that I think really kind of helped us more so than other companies. This, it, you know, leadership starts from the top and this really, really accelerated how we were able to deal with this. There's no wasting time or extra layers of bureaucracy to cut through. We have rapidly made decisions throughout this unprecedented period. 
Very early on, we established two very important criteria to drive decision makings. Number one was we would assess global government directives, which continue to change daily and still does, and therefore required a really flexible and agile response. And then two, we assess the global infection rates, which also change daily. Only one of these two triggers needed to be affected to change our company's posture. Conversely, the same two criteria were used to scale back various restrictions to resume normal standard operating procedures. Here at BMS, we recognized that we needed to establish quick principles to guide our global workforce. Those principles that were established before the global workforce was asked to work from home, unless designated as on-site critical, became our guiding light. They communicated clearly to the workforce through global town halls, business function town halls, and written communications. So this would be a good time to mention the critical importance of communication. The corporate event response team was blessed with a very competent communications lead that really understood that during a crisis, you need to be transparent and can communicate effectively and efficiently and as often as needed. It's much the same for communicating with a cancer patient. It's really important. In the business setting, without this communication, your workforce is left in the dark and the stress, anxiety, and uncertainty only increases. This pandemic is uncertain. We continuously learn new things about it every day. To combat this uncertainty, the most important thing we can do as a company was to communicate transparently about the company's directives and path moving forward. We've held weekly meetings with our global site leaders and general managers to gain an understanding of what challenges they face locally. We provided leadership, directives, and policies on how to bring people back to our sites and offer medical advice related to the virus as we learn more. Here's another example of the corporate event response team's early actions. We established three principles and communicated them immediately. Number one was protecting the health and safety of all of our workforce. Number two was ensuring the continued supply of medicines to our patients. And number three was focusing on the long-term and sustainable competitive position of the company. We also developed a set of priorities to guide us and communicated them as well. First and foremost, we need to serve our customer and patient's needs by ensuring the uninterrupted supply of medicines to our patients across the workforce. GRIT and other healthcare advocacy groups understand the importance of getting drugs to our patients. We prioritize the health and safety of our workforce by implementing health and safety controls, such as providing personal protective equipment, enabling physical distancing, and enhanced deep cleaning. We also publicly recognized our workforce, which Tina Marie had also commented on, who continued to come into our work sites at our, mostly our manufacturing sites and labs, despite what was going on with the infection rate. Whether it was increasing or decreasing, they still came to work to be able to fulfill that obligation of getting medicines to our patients. They should be recognized, and we did. We recognized them for their Herculean efforts in doing this. And all along these lines, we op here's the most important part, I think. We operated with compassion and flexibility by addressing individual needs as we transitioned to new ways of working. We instilled workplace flexibility to protect the most vulnerable members of our workforce and support those who continue to come to work remotely. The uncertainty of this virus creates this unbelievable level of stress and anxiety. For families with school-aged children or taking care of someone in the home, working from home has become a daunting task. The uncertainty and lack of standardization on how children return to school became an incredible distraction and concern. BMS remains conscientious of these challenges and established teams and employee assistance programs to help workers and their families cope with these challenges. We also provide a great deal of technologies for making working from home as effective as possible. As a global company, timelines and circumstances have varied across the globe. However, we are guided by science and medical advice to continuously assess local government directives, conditions, and restrictions while ensuring global consistency and visibility. And finally, we model key learnings by looking internally and externally to gain key insights. Consistent with our mission and values, 
Bristol Myers Squibb has taken actions to help our global community during this unprecedented time. Besides focusing on protecting the health and safety of our workforce, ensuring there is no disruption to the supply of our medicines to patients, and supporting relief efforts across the globe, we took the following actions. We globally engaged policymakers and key policy stakeholders, including trade associations, strategic alliances, and coalitions in an effort to ensure patients can continue to access their medicines amid this COVID crisis. Our highest priorities during this time are the health and safety of our workforce and ensuring a safe, reliable supply of medicines to our patients. As it relates to ongoing operation, operations of clinical trials, we are working with health authorities and investigators to protect our trial participants and personnel at Bristol-Myers Squibb and our clinical trial sites while ensuring regulatory compliance and integrity of our science. An important element of keeping our promised patients, their families and our physician partners is to ensure that our supply chain continues to deliver our medicines without interruption. We are committed to providing financial support to patients who need it to ensure they can access our medicines without interruption and without excessive burden. Through our existing patient support programs, we've been in, which have been in place for over 25 years, we offer copay support for all BMS promoted medicines to US patients who need assistance. The expansion of the company's existing patient support programs provided near-term relief to patients related to the loss of their jobs and employer insurance coverage, which started on March 1st, 2020, and ensured that patients can be enrolled in the company's programs rapidly and continued treatment during this unprecedented time. We are supporting our healthcare partners by putting into place effective virtual engagement, much like the one we're doing today, which helps them minimize the spread of COVID-19. We are contributing to COVID-19 re relief efforts through the Bristol-Myers Squibb Foundation, which is an independent charitable organization. They've provided more than $5 million in financial support and needed products in affected areas around the world with more provided every day. The company has also made targeted donations of personal protection equipment and other equipment to help community partners in the United States, as well as donated funds, equipment, expertise to help local communities and individual markets, including Italy, Greece, Israel, Romania, Canada, Korea, and China. And here's a really cool thing. My BMS colleagues across the world have also volunteered medical support, both virtually and on the ground. Through a program called Skills to Give, an ongoing BMS volunteer program, our colleagues in the US, UK, and Australia are volunteering virtually with thousands of nonprofit organizations. BMS colleagues with medical expertise have been encouraged to volunteer in local hospitals, and the company has in place flexible work hours to enable colleagues to do so while continuing to carry out their day-to-day -day responsibilities. We are working with researchers and the biotech community and the broader life science industries on ways we together can accelerate, accelerate therapies for COVID-19. We are grateful to healthcare professionals on the front lines who are fighting to contain this virus and helping patients with COVID-19 and for advocacy groups like GRIT. Thank you so much. As, a responsible global, as responsible global citizens, we will take all necessary actions to promote public health and carry out our mission of providing life-sustaining medicines to the patients who depend on us. Thank you for all you do. As the daughter of a military dad, I like to say, one team, one fight. We can do this together. Thank you.